name is Wayne Smith. My ancestry has been in Surrey for over 200 years. And I'm uh, descended from uh, any number of uh, Surrey families, the Gaspars, the Smiths, the Smiths are more recent, the, um, the Tree Wurgies, the Carlisles, we can go on all day, but let's not. So anyway, I have been asked to talk about this particular incident, which I first heard about probably 30 years ago. My great aunt, Ruth Gaspar, uh, she became Ruth Gaspar Connor. She said, I want you to meet Julia Trewergy Hinckley. You've got to meet Julia Hinckley. So I said, okay. I didn't know who Julia Hin Hinckley was at that time. But anyway, I found her. I got her address and she invited me to come and, and meet with her. And while there, she shared all sorts of information that she had researched about the Trewergy family. And at some point, she mentioned that, uh, that there was this, tra this tragedy, the Surrey tragedy of 1877, and I didn't know anything about it. Uh, it turns out that several of my relatives, the Tree Word Jesus and Gaspars, lost their lives in this. And so I started learning a little bit more about it. And then, recently, uh, talking with Deb and Jeff Benham, uh, they said they had a lot of information on it, and I said, well, maybe we can work this up into a presentation, and here I am. <laughs> That's what I get for raising my hand sometimes. So anyway, we are talking about the Surrey tragedy of 1877, and John has given it this, the surtitle, the subtitle of Surrey Boy's Tragic Voyage. So, this story, I can divide it fairly easily into three parts. Part A is the background information. Who were the families that were involved? They're all Surrey families. And then there's going to be some information about the voyage itself, which took place between uh, <coughs> September and December of 1877. And then finally, I'll be talking about the aftermath of that voyage. And there's a lot of interesting information. Okay. The background, the families. These are the families that were directly involved in this, the three Wurgis, and I'll give you more information about each one of them. The Gaspars, the Merrills, the Colemans, the Carters, and the Grindles. Of all these names, one of them might not look familiar as a Surrey name, and that would be the Colemans. And to be honest, uh, I only happened across that name at the last minute, and I'll mention it when, when it comes up. But uh, originally, Julia Tree working in doing her transcriptions of some of the old letters, thought that the last name was Ohman, O-H-M-A-N. But I was able to locate the original name as Coleman. And I'm not sure if they were Surrey family or not. But there's more. Okay, let's talk first about the Tree Wurgies. There was a man named Levi Townsend Tree Wurgie. He lived from 1819 to 1902, and he married Amelia Young Honston who lived from 1824 to 1905. <coughs> Levi had been married once before. His wife, unfortunately, died in childbirth. Uh, so his, his wife died the day that his daughter was born. And Margaret lived to be, I think, about 50. Then he married Permelia and had seven children. The oldest was Celestia Permelia Treeworthy, who married Gardner Granville Gaspar, who was the first person that we will be finding out about in this story. She had a younger sister, Arvilla, and Adelma. They were twins. Then there was Cicerlina, I love the name, Cicerlina Jane, but they called her Jenny, who married William Fox. She lived in Massachusetts later on. Wilfred L. Treeworthy and Augustus T. Treeworthy were fairly close. They, they were five years apart. They were not twins, uh, as, as several people had thought. But um, they do look a lot alike. You'll see a picture later. And then a Lyndall Lincoln or Link tree which some of you probably might, possibly might remember him. Uh, so let's, let's go on. Oops. So Levi himself was quite a character, and I have some information about him that I'd like to read. This was, these are from notes that were written by Julia Hinckley, who lived in Blue Hill. She lived on the mountain road in Blue Hill, and she was a wonderful person and did a lot of research. She wrote, I was told by Myra Billington, who remembered Levi, that he was quite tall and stocky. He had light curly hair and blue eyes, and he wore a small beard. She said that he, he was a very kind man, and the people liked and respected him. 
Levi settled at the, t the lower end of Main Street in Surrey Village, where he bought land and built his house in 1847. The house still stands, and it's the last one on the north side of the road, just before it starts to make a sharp left turn going towards Blue Hill. If you know where the Surrey store is, it's the first house to the right of it. It's behind a bunch of trees. I didn't even know that that house existed until I looked for it one day, and I said, oh, there's a house there, because it was it's fairly well covered with trees. It's a well kept up white house, perhaps 40 feet from the road, and it sits on a slope. It had two dormer windows on the front and an L on the eastern end. Now, over the years, Levi worked at a number of different trades. From the 1850s to the 1870s, the census listed him as a mariner. He started out as a ship's carpenter and later started serving as captain of three and four masted vessels. When he registered for the Civil War draft, in 1863, he said that he was a shoemaker. In the 1880s, the census listed him as a farmer, yet he was also dealing in mining properties in Surrey. And I know that uh, Irene is interested in mining in Surrey. Still later in life, he ran a general store in a small building which he erected near the road on his house lot. At one time, the post office was in this building, possibly during his lifetime. He owned several lots of land in Surrey, which added to a considerable amount, which added up to a considerable amount. He worked this land and he had wood cut on it. He had a large garden every year in, in which he raised all of his vegetables. Now, then I became a member of the Baptist Church on May 2nd, 1852, and his wife, Cornelia, on January 8th, 1858. In 1865, a group of 26 men agreed to pay the sum set against their names toward an organ. The total amount pledged was $120, and Levi pledged $7. Now, $7 now means nothing. $7 then? <coughs> Levi was active in the church, having served on the pulpit committee and the finance committee. He taught the Sunday school adult Bible class for many years, and Myra Billington told me, meaning Julia, that he was an excellent teacher. He also sang in church, and he had a fine bass voice. One of his grand granddaughters thinks that he also played the violin. In 1866, Levi and his wife, Cornelia, apparently had some trouble with the Reverend Hervey Hawes, who could not, who could not uh, and these problems could not seem to be re reconciled. So upon motion of brother Charles B. Trewerty, Levi's brother, it was voted that they be excommunicated, <laughs> although they were later reinstated at the, same time. at the same time, it was voted that their daughter Arvilla, whose name we saw earlier, who was 19 years old at the time, that she also be excommunicated because at the time she was showing spiritualist tendencies, such as moving the kitchen table. <laughs> and this was not condoned by the Baptist Church. <laughs> An amusing anecdote told to me by Helen McGraw, whose father, Alston Milliken, lived for a while with Levi's family when he was a small boy. He told her many times about being in the back of Levi's house one Sunday, playing in the brook with a makeshift boat. It seems that Levi always read the Bible all day on Sundays, and that everyone was supposed to stay in the house and listen. <laughs> Evidently, Alston slipped out without being seen. And he said that, that very soon Levi came running up through the field, his hair flying, and shouted to him, What are you doing up here, desecrating the Sabbath? By the slaving stashies, Ollie, you come right back down here and listen to the mandates of the Bible. Evidently, this little incident impressed Alston, and he always remembered it. He said that Levi was, a ver was very good to him while he lived at his house. Now, Levi's wife is Cornelia Young Honchton, tree uh, She cared for the town paupers in their house for several years, which, in addition to raising her own large family, must have made her very much overworked. And her life was difficult and no doubt very frustrating, so that in later years she became a complaining, harsh, and severe woman. That's the way Julia expressed it. A November newspaper item in 1903 from the Ellsworth American stated that Mrs. Pervilia Treeworthy, widow of Levi, is ill with heart disease. 
A later article states that Mrs. Vermilia Triwarchi is very low. Apparently, she recovered from this illness and went to live with her daughter, Arvilla, in Lynn, Massachusetts, as she died there in 1905. According to a newspaper item, according to a newspaper item, and her remains were brought back to Surrey for burial. Okay. Now, Levi and Vermilia had seven children. This is from the town records, the town of Surrey's records. You can see the, the seven children, Celestia P, who was born in 1845, Arvilla and Adelma, the twins, and then Cicerlina, I love that name, Wilfred, Augustus, and Alando, also known as, his middle name was Lincoln, and he was normally called Link. Link. Let's go through some pictures that we found. <coughs> Celestia, the oldest, lived from 1845 to 1920. Her husband was Gardner Granville Gaspar. Gardner was like the seventh child of Francisco Manuel Gaspar, who came from the Azores. And yes, I speak Portuguese, because I'm descended from that family. And uh, he was, he was uh, a lot of the members of the family were involved with the, with, you know, with the sea. They were on, working on boats and all this. And Granville, among other, they often called him Granville, um, among other things, got this job working on a merchant, uh, a merchant boat, a merchant ship, which is what the story about is about tonight. Uh, moving on, there were the three girls in the middle. There was Arvilla and her twin, Adelma. Adelma died when she was only nine years old, and she's buried up here at the uh, uh, Surrey Town Cemetery. And Cicerlina Jane, or Jenny Treewardy, married William Knox in ended up living in Somerville, Massachusetts. Now, the boys in the middle, there was Wilfred L. Treewarchy and Augustus T. Treewarchy. They do look a lot alike, and uh, like I say, people have thought that they were twins, but they weren't. And bringing up the rear, we have Alinda Lincoln, or Link Treewarchy, who lived, to be, lived until 1939. So, from Link is descended our own Jeff Benham standing there adjusting the fan. <laughs> he must be a fan of fans. So. All right. Now, much of what we know about the Surrey tragedy of 1877 is from materials that were passed down from Link to his granddaughter, Florence Trubert. And then these things are now in the possession of Jeff and Deb. Okay, another name that we need to know about is Arthur P. Carter. His family originally came from Sedgwick. You notice on the left there that the first one, two, three, six children in that family were born in Sedgwick. And Arthur was the oldest of them. He was born in 1847. We see that somewhere between 1859 and 1861, the family moved to Surrey because the rest of the children were born here in Surrey. I don't know too much more about that. His father was Vespasian Carter, Carter, and I have heard of him. And then Arthur, it was an interesting situation. In 1876, on December 14th, Arthur wrote three IOUs to Wilfred L. Treewarch. One of them, and he wrote them all on the same day. The first one was for $100 with interest at 8%, which would be paid 10 months after the date. That would be October 14, 1877. Then there was a second one, for again for $100, that was going to be due October 14, 1878. And finally, there was a $50 loan uh, to be paid back by October 14, 1879. This, is, this becomes significant. Okay, now we have this Morris Coleman, maybe Maurice, I'm not sure how we pronounce it. We thought his name was Coleman, but apparently it was Coleman. I was able to find uh, a reference to his mother, Mrs. Coleman, it said, written by the captain of the ship. <clears throat> uh, beyond that, I only know that his mother's name was Mary, and I don't know anything else about it, except that Howard Jellison, whom many of you might remember, he said that all the crew members of the schooner Joshua Grindle, which is what we're getting to to tonight, were sorry boys. And finally, there was an Isaac middle name Lincoln Merrill, born in Surrey in 1861, the son of Samuel and Anna S. Merrill. 
He's the next to the last name here, Isaac L. Then, we mentioned a couple of times his name, Joshua Grindle. Now, Joshua Grindle was born right up, right, up, right here in Surrey, up the uh, road there, up to Blue Hill, the top of the hill. In 1844, the son of Judge Robert Grindle and his wife Mary Varn. Now, I understand that Judge Robert Grindle was involved in one of Surrey's two murders. There was the one that, the name of which I've forgotten, uh, that happened. Someone help me. Kelly Lane. They built a lot of schooners there. 
Okay, this is the Ellsworth, Surrey line. Here's Kelly Lane, comes down here and advance to the right. I'm not exactly sure where the shipyard was located. Maybe someone knows? Anyway, some, somewhere here, right opposite Ellsworth, there was a shipyard and they built a lot of schooners there. So it's possible that they were sort of right when they said, well, it was built in Ellsworth, meaning the Ellsworth shipyard, which was actually located in Surrey. <laughs> Whatever, there's a little bit of a question mark, but the official story is that it was built in Ellsworth. Oh yeah, and then another guy you need to hear about was the captain. William Allen Freedy, 1847 to 1918. He was born in Surrey. He died in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and is buried in Brooklyn. To be honest, I don't know if it's Brooklyn, Maine, or Brooklyn, New York, because he had lived there for a while. Whatever. He was married to, remember that Joshua Grindle? He was married to his sister, Susan Means Grindle. And you'll understand later why I wrote, and oh yeah, the captain. Part B, the voyage. So we have this schooner, the Joshua Grindle, built in Sarajevo, 1873 4. And it was busy, you know, delivering goods here and there along the east coast of the United States and sometimes to the West Indies. In this particular voyage, the captain was William Allen Freedy, the mate was Gardner Granville Gaspar. Then they had the two brothers, Wilford and Augustus Treworgy. There was this mystery man, Morris Coleman, and Arthur Carter. And then there was Isaac Lincoln Merrill. They called him Lincoln. And uh, he was apparently a, a cabin boy. His title was never, his official position was never elucidated. But anyway, so there were these seven people in the crew. Now, it turns out that Wilfred and Augustus, they kept, or I shouldn't say Wilfred, both of them, uh, put together a log of their voyage. And this particular one started uh, on September 23rd of 1877. They called it Journal from Home in Surrey toward the spellings, the handwriting was not clear, St. Gaivis or something, in Cuba, September 23rd, 1877. Okay. We're not exactly sure what that mystery word is. There, this is what they wrote. Left home, this is literally what they wrote. Left home at 5 a.m. with sorrowful parting and tears for Bucksport. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know exactly how they got from Surrey to Bucksport. Mm -hmm. They walked in, you know, taken a carriage, ridden, ridden a boat, taken an Uber, I don't know. <laughs> but somehow they got to Bucksport. From Bucksport to Boston, they write, to take the steamboat for Boston, arriving there on the 24th, that would be the 24th of September, 1877. Big doings in Boston. First, they went, they went to see their sister, that would be our villa, who was living in Salem. And then Wilford went to Lawrence, Massachusetts. He visited his intended, Jane, Janie Essington. And they got married on the 26th of September. <clears throat> that was sweet. Then they were off to New York. So on the 29th of September, they sailed for New York and they arrived there on the 30th of September. This is 1877. That's where they got on the Joshua Grindle. It was uh, in port in New York. So they went on board the three-mastered schooner Joshua Grindle and sailed on the 8th of uh, October. While they were in New York, they did New York things. They went out and bought stuff. It, it, one thing that they bought was something called oil clothes. Can someone tell me what oil clothes are? What are oil clothes? Rain slickers. Rain slickers. I thought it might be something like that, but it's a term I, I looked it up in, online. I couldn't find anything about oil clothes. I found all sorts of articles about how to get oil out of clothes. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. So, 
Now, they, they got on the Joshua Grindle and they sailed on the 8th of October with 15 days pa passage. It would, normally would have taken them 15 days to get to Santiago de Cuba, which would bring it on the 23rd of October. However, on the 22nd of October, we had a thunderstorm. The lightning struck the mate, Gaspar, across his chest, and he inhaled it and so hurt his lungs that he soon spit blood. The 25th, he took the yellow fever and died. So he was the first casualty. Wilford was struck in, in his legs by the lightning, which tripped him up, and he fell to the deck, but without serious damage. So he survived that. Finally, they arrived at St. Jago. That was their destination in the West Indies. Okay. It turns out, it took me a while to figure out that St. Jago was actually what we now call Santiago de Cuba, which is on the southern, southeastern part of uh, Cuba. Okay. We're not sure exactly when, but at some point in late, late October, they reached St. Jago, as they called it. One newspaper account said that not only Gardner Gaspar, but also Morris Coleman had died. In, he died in St. Jago, and they were buried there, both victims of yellow fever. The logbook notes only discharged and then loaded with sugar. So in the logbook, they didn't make any reference to the deaths. So, Wilford and Augustus, apparently they had a couple of days in uh, St. Jago, that they were able to send a message back home to let their sister, Celestia, know that her husband had died. And so they sent, it, sent word to his widow, their sister, like I say, Celestia Gaspar, saying that she need not worry too much as they would help her to bring, to bring up her three small children. And that would be Eugene Granville Gaspar, who was 12 at the time, <coughs> Millie Ardell Gaspar, who was nine, and Ernest Elwood Gaspar, who Six at the time. Five. Okay, so they finished their work in St. Jago and they were getting ready to leave. Now, it says, in clearing up and getting ready for sea, he got heated up so that in two hours after sailing, Wilford was taken with yellow fever. They sweated it out and he took a little cold. The congestion got in his lungs and we find out from another source. Four days from port, he died on the 12th of November in 1877. On the 14th, the steward, the steward, Arthur P. Carter, also died. And then Augustus took the yellow fever and they sweated him, and he was getting better when Wilfred's body was put over the side. Of course, that's how you bury someone at sea. This, is a, this was not a photograph taken at that time, but here's a representation of someone who died at sea they wrapped him up and then putting him over the gangway. <clears throat> so uh, Augustus was called to the gangway to see him, but the scene was too much for him to bear. And this is exactly the words that they wrote. He lost hurt desperately. He got crazy. His nose bled fearfully and he was sick. He said that he was sick and he told them to tell his father to come to get him, but without a fail. He fainted away and he died on the 14th of November, 1877. Both Arthur and Augustus were also buried at sea. So with a crew of two, the two remaining crew members were the captain, William A. Freeby, and the young cabin boy, Lincoln Merrill. Details are scarce, but it appears that on November 16th, the brig Romance, the name of the ship, belonging to the Navassa Phosphate Company, was returning from Navassa. Now, Navassa is a small island just to the west of this peninsula from Haiti. This is Cuba. Jamaica is right over here. And this little island of Navassa is famous for guano. Right. Uh, they had a load of the most valuable fertilizer, the phosphatic guano, or phosphate of lime, found in vast deposits on the island of Navassa. There's an island out in the, 
in the Pacific that has the same reputation. Um, help me remember the name. Say again. Nauru. N a u r u. Same situation. It's, you know, all these sea seabirds are all over the place pooping, and somehow that becomes excellent fertilizer. <laughs> so anyway, the the romance, the brig romance, had a crew including a number of African American sailors and four of them were added to the crew. So according to a newspaper report from December of 1877, the Brig Romance gave them four Negro sailors to work the Joshua Brindle into port, which would have taken them from somewhere off the eastern tip of Cuba back to New York. So that was the trip, that was the voyage. Now let's look at the aftermath. Seven crew members left, only two returned. William A. Freedy, the captain, and Lincoln Nero, the captain boy. That means that we lost Gardner, Granville Gaspar, and Maurice Coleman. They were buried there in Cuba, in St. Diego, or Santiago de Cuba. And now it's making me think, someday I need to go to Cuba and see if I can find where he's buried. I don't know if I can find it. Then, Wilfred L. Treewergy and Augustus T. Treewergy, and then also Arthur P. Carter, were all buried at sea. When Wilfred's wife, Janie Essington Treewergy, the one that he married just before they left, when she heard of the death, she went berserk, and she was searching for him among the banking boards. This is according to Julia Hinckley's story. What's a banking? I assume that means the banking on the, the edges of, your, uh, of the house, of the bank. I assume that that's what it meant, the banking boards. I don't think they, I don't think she went to the bank to it. But I think, I don't know what else banking boards would refer to, so I assume that it must be the boards that they put against the side of the house. Whatever, she went nuts for a while. She did eventually remarry, I did, I did find that reference. So anyway, the struggle for justice then begins. So the five men who died were all owed the money that they had earned. And their families reached out to the captain, William A. Freely, to seek reparations. Sorry, I can't see that distance very well. I should look up here. <laughs> the earliest correspondence that I was able to find was dated on December 24th, 1877. Remember, they arrived back in New York on December 8th, so a couple of weeks later. They, uh, the family here in Surrey had heard about it. And Mrs. Treewergy, Vermilia on the right, had written to Captain Freeby to find out what's, what's going on. And he responded in a letter on December 24th. Let's take a look at this. He said, and I, this is exactly the way he spelled it, I was going to send the boys' money to Wilford's wife and Mr. Treewergy, but it was the boys' intention for you to have the whole. But by rights, Mr. Treewergy and Wilford's wife are the ones to settle with. Now, if you want me to, I can send you the most of their wages and send the bills and accounts to them and have everything straight. Susan, and that's Captain Freedy's wife. Susan means Brindle. Susan told me what you said about it, so you can write me a line to Fernandino, which is the address down at the bottom here, it's in Florida, and I will send you the money from those, or I will send it to the, to the other as you think best, but I want to do what is right and have the boy's intentions carried out. There will be about $18 of Gus's wages and 17 of Wilford's. I can fix it so you can have about 13 of Augustus and about 12 of Wilford's. The things I have sent to Ellsworth, three trunks, one bag, Mr. Gaspar, Gus and Wilford, and Arthur Carter things. Please answer this as soon as you receive it and I will do as you direct to me. I sail tonight. Truly yours, W.A. Freeby. And he gave his address in Fernandino. <coughs> so far, so good. And then Levi, having received that letter, wrote back on December 31st, 1877. 
Dear Sir, we received your letter on the 25th and have been much disappointed that you did not do this business before you left New York. You said you would send the bills when you sent the money. We know that they took money with them and Augustus bought a suit of oil clothes in New York. Wilfords said that he agreed for $20 a month and the wages of the post was $25 a month when you left New York. It's a little hard to follow exactly what's going on here. If anyone has any wonderful understanding, I would appreciate it. L. Merrill, and that would be Lincoln, the youngest one, he was 16 years old. L. Merrill and I, of course they all knew each other from here in Surrey, can claim their wages up to the 8th of December when you arrive in New York by law, which is two months and nine days pay, which is $46.35, besides the extra that you was to pay him for the carpenter work on the cabin, and you know what that was. Please state them Augustus's wages for $18 a month for two months and nine days, which would be $41.40. And they bought 50 cigars, one quarter of <laughs> LM, of course that's Lincoln Merrill, the 16-year-old, says now please settle this business just right so that there will be no hereafter about it, for grief is such as will only end with our lives through the loss of our children crying for our health. That's pretty deep. You can send Wilford's wages to Mrs. Jane Tremorgy and Augustus's wages to me. It's all the same whether I have it or my wife. Yours, L.T. Tremorgy. By the way, I need to also say, when I met Julia Tremorgy Hinckley about 30, 40 years ago, she made me promise but I would always pronounce that name Treewardy. She didn't want to hear any other pronunciations. So I promised. So I always say Treewardy. You may pronounce it any way you want. <laughs> you didn't make the promise to Julia. I did. <laughs> I loved Julia. What a wonderful woman. So, Freedy responds to Levi's letter. And he says, I am very much obliged to you for figuring of the boy's wages but it looks to me like that you thought more of, of one cent fifty cigars, one quart of rum, than the loss of your sons. <laughs> I did not send the accounts if you will take the trouble to write to the United States Shipping Commission. You will get a statement of your son's accounts as I had to settle with them and they will settle with you. We only pay a man for what time he is on board, and the ship keep a log book on board, and a man to keep to keep it rolled up. And you will find that in and you will find in that the dates of your son's death, and on the shipping articles the day they went on for, and that will be the way to settle with you. It was being rather curt. And he also added, if I had known what kind of a man I was dealing with. I would not so much as wrote you a letter, but let you find it out through the USSC, the Shipping Commission. And also, their things the commissioner claimed, but as they was full of yellow fever, they thought that they would not take them. So I took the trouble to send them home. All there is on board belonging to the boys is Wilford's tools, and I will send them by express if you wish it to his wife, but not to you. <laughs> if Wilford, interesting spellings here. If Wilford had finished the cabin, I would have paid him something, but I did not agree to pay him anything until after his work was done. But it was left in such a way that it will cost more than Wilford's wages amounts to to finish up, finish it up. And he ends. Wilford and Augustus was good, nice boys but I should think their, their father was about half fool as crazy. I don't know which, and by all accounts, he has been, he has been so for some years past. W.A. Freebie. Go to the USSC and get satisfaction, and there will be no hereafter. Uh, this is a good time to point out what they have just moved. This is one of the trunks that was sent from New York 
And I don't know if Ethan had to go through fumigation, as he refers to, to refer to. Well, whatever, it was sent, and it's been in, it was sent in those, I guess it was in Link's family for a while, and then made it down to your mother's family, and now you have it. Now, there were two, and it's possible that the other trunk might have been sent to uh, Celestia Gaspar. My sister has it. Oh, then you know. Okay, that's where the other one was. Thank you, I didn't know that. So his, his sister has the other trunk. I've got a box of tools. Oh, you have the tools too. At that point, they hadn't been sent. All right. Now, Celestia's younger sister, Arvilla, wrote a letter home on January 18th of 1878 from Salem. Dear father, mother, and all, I received your letter this forenoon, so this afternoon I went down to Jen's, that would be her next youngest sister, Sister Lena, who was known as Jenny, in Somerville. It is too bad you can't collect the boy's honest dues without any trouble. Can you stop the vessel if the captain chases her and hires the man himself? If he hadn't a mind to pay, does it make any difference? If the owners or agents charters her about stopping the vessel to get the pay. It's a little confusing to figure out exactly what she's referring to, but um, obviously the whole family was trying to deal with this whole issue. How do we deal with it? Then, Captain Freely writes a letter to Celestia Gaspar. This is January 29. You must not expect me to know all of Mr. Gaspar's things, Gasper's things, or what he had, for I never overhauled things after Wilford, Wilford packed up in St. Jago. When we got to New York, everything on board had to be fumigated, and the boy's things was put in the forward house and smoked, and smoked by the Brooklyn Board of Health, Brooklyn, New York. I was not on board when it was done, and they laid there a day or two, then Mr. Eldridge and Mr. Coulter, Someone like these two people, I think, are both from Surrey. I don't know what they were doing in New York. Anyway, they helped pack them up. Mr. Coulter packed Arthur's things, and Eldridge and myself packed the other things. Wilford's trunk, we have on. I think he means. Huh? Nothing. Oh, I thought I heard. Uh, Wilford's trunk, we have. I think it's supposed to be on board. And, and we put everything we could find into two chests in the bag. If you received two chests and one clothes bag, you received all that we sent from the vessel, and all there is on board is the tools. I should have sent your father the boy's wages, but receiving a letter from him, which I could not stand, <laughs> so I have put it, I, I have put it someone else's hand to settle, and probably he will not get but very little of their wages. If he had not wrote me such a letter, I might have saved the wages for them and paid every cent was due, but now I will have nothing to do with it. I hear that your father and mother, I think it, he meant, thinks very hard of me, and I am very sorry for it, for it will only cause more troubles on top of their sorrows. Now, Mrs. Gasper, you have received every cent which is due, and everything has been sent home. Now, if you should have any hard feeling toward me, I think the least said, the better. <laughs> this is the only thing where he showed a little bit of empathy. The sprig that was taken from the tree over his grave, I will send by someone coming home. So apparently they took a sprig off of the tree under which he was buried. Truly yours, W.A. way free. So, eventually, uh, Levi was made administrator of Wilford's estate. That's April of 1878, so that's what, another three months later. On April 19th, Judge Parker Tuck, Hancock County Judge of Probate, appointed Wilford's father, Levi Townsend Freeborgy, as administrator of Wilford's estate, <coughs> giving him until June 19th of 1879 to render a plain and true account of your said administration. Three days later, there was an agreement made between Jenny and Treborgy, that would be Wilford's wife, that he married on the 27th of September, just before they left, on the first part, and Levi T. Treborgy and Cornelia Y. Treborgy of the second part. If the parties of the second part, Levi and his wife, 
used their endeavors to collect the monies due the estate of Wilfred L. Freeworthy, that she will assist them with her name whenever requested, and when the said money is collected, she will be content with $150, and that the parties of the second part retain $50 each. Signed and sealed in the presence of us, Lincoln A. Freeworthy. That's your great grandfather. Uh, and I don't know if this if his name is correct. It said P. Lee Floyd, I think. Not sure. They were witnesses. And it was signed by Janie Trewarchy, Cornelia Trewarchy, and Levi Trewarchy. Did everything get resolved? <laughs> Probably not. It also seems certain that Arthur Carter did not repay Wilford for the full amount of the two hundred and fifty dollars that Arthur borrowed from Wilford back on December 14th of 1876. I mean, he was one of the ones that died. What is known is that the Trewergy family and all of their descendants have, made, have remained bitter towards Captain Freedy ever since. <laughs> so whatever happened to Captain William Allen Freedy? Well, in a January 1884 article in the Ellsworth American, we read that Captain William Freedy late of the schooner Joshua Grendel, has gone to Kingston, Jamaica, where he will take command of the British steamer Craigallion, which will ply during the winter between Boston and St. Cuevos. I had to look up St. Cuevos. This is where St. Jago or Santiago de Cuba is located. This is St. Cuevos, so it's part of the west of Cuba. In 1900 and 1910, he is found in the census living with his daughter Jenny Younghouse in Brooklyn, New York. He died in Holyoke, Massachusetts in 1915. And what ever happened to Isaac Lincoln Merrill? Well, he married first to Lydia Chamberlain Horn of Chelsea, Massachusetts, and had two children. Carlton Horn Merrill, 1891, in Boston. Elizabeth Amelia Merrill, 1897, also in Boston. Then she died, he married second, Leila Barber of Brewer on August 15th of 1906, and they had Isaac Lincoln and Merrill II, born in 1910 in Canada. In 1910, Lincoln and Leila were living in Los Angeles, where he was the director of a mine. In 1920, they were still in Los Angeles, and they had two Swedish servants. In 1930, they were living in Daytona Beach, Florida, where he was the president of a mining company. In 1935, they were still living in Volusia County, Florida, near Daytona Beach. Lincoln died on June 10, 1936, and he was buried in Ormond Beach, Florida. He did fairly well. He was the little 16-year-old on that boat. Whatever happened to the schooner Joshua Grindle? We have a little bit of reading to do. I think I can see it better. This is from the Mendocino Beacon. The Mendocino Beacon, a newspaper from Mendocino, California. This is September 23rd of 1883. The three-masted schooner Joshua Grindle, and the captain is a Mr. A Mr. Hughes, which is now loading with lumber at this port for San Diego, so it's very much out in California at this point, has a somewhat notable history. She was built in, quote, Ellsworth, Maine, several years ago for the West Indies trade. The gentleman in honor for whom she was named had, had been at that time some years a resident of Mendocino, but was so favorably remembered in Maine, where his, boy, where his boyhood and youth were spent, that he received the flattering testimonial as a token of the estimation in which he was held there. At least that's what they said. For some reason it was named after him. So someone must have liked it. Before she went to, before she went to sea, the vessel was furnished with a library by the Seaman's Friends Society, and Mr. Grindle, in recognition of giving his name to the schooner, presented a large Bible. These books are still on board for the use of the crew when they have leisure and disposition to read. At one of, on one of her West Indies voyages, she had the misfortune to encounter the yellow fever and lost five of her crew by that dreadful malady. The names of these poor men are recorded in the Bible belonging to the vessel. Do you have that Bible by chance? No. 
After plowing the Atlantic for several years, she somehow got the California fever. And to encourage her, several enterprising young men of Mendocino bought, her, bought out her eastern owners and had her fitted out for a cruise around the Horn. That's all the way down to the bottom of South America. She took a cargo of general merchandise for Chile and lo loaded there with nitrate of soda for San Francisco, where she arrived on May 25, 1882. She was brought around the Horn by Captain Merrill. I don't know if there's any connection between this Captain Merrill and Lincoln Merrill. I don't think so. Who afterwards went out as a master of a brig to the Samoan Islands, where he was shipwrecked and where and he he and to the end, and he and his vessel perished together. Since her arrival on the coast, the Joshua Grindle has been under the charter of L. E. White and has been employed in carrying ties and lumber to sub southern ports of California. I have a question for you. When they say ties, I'm sure it's not this kind of tie. Are they railroad ties? They used to hew them off on both sides. Ah, so they would hew both sides? Yeah, they would, they would cut a tree down and hew them off. Good. So a lot of these things I've had no experience with, so I have to ask you for help. Okay. We carry, uh, carry ties and lumber to Southern Forge, California. Her first trip up the coast was to Little River, where she arrived on June 12, 1882, and loaded at once with ties for San Diego. Last April, she came near her near ending her career at San Juan Capistrano. That's where the swallows go. A brief account of which was given in the beacon of April 28. She came out of the breakers, however, although considerably damaged, which it required a considerable portion of the season's earnings to repair. This is the original article from April 28. The schooner Joshua Grindle was recently rescued from imminent peril. This schooner, mostly owned in this place and bearing the name of one of our own citizens, broke her anchor chain at San Juan Capistrano and went into the breakers. The captain was ashore, but the mate was equal to the occasion, and by hoisting sail and skillful handling, got her out and took her to Wilmington. I don't think it was Wilmington that dealt with. <laughs> Mendocino Beacon, 1885. We recently met Captain Robert A. Ackerman, well known here as he was for many years in charge of the schooner at Alfred between this port and San Francisco. He now commands the three-master schooner Joshua Grindle, which has just loaded at Noyo with uh, posts for White and Plummer, apparently a company. Um, about six weeks later, the schooner Joshua Grindle from San Francisco to Port Discovery went ashore on Protection Island off the coast of Oregon on the afternoon of the 17th of this month. The revenue cutter Oliver Wolcott has gone to her aid and will try to pull her off at high tide. August 1st, the schooner Joshua Grindle, which recently went ashore on Protection Island, has been successfully floated. But, two years later, according to the book by Michael White, Shipwrecks of the California Coast, on April 15th, 1887, the Joshua Grindle schooner ashore and wrecked at Pismo Beach, which is somewhat south of Calgary, uh, San Francisco. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sure that if you do your homework, you'll figure out that this all. 
and the, obviously anyone connected to the tree orgies, the carters, uh, the gas bars, uh, you know, are connected to this story. Other questions? Okay. SurreyHistoricalSociety.com and our Facebook page, Surrey Historical Society. Thank you all for coming, for your support, and the refreshment table is open. And don't forget that in October... In October, uh, the Historical Society is going to have three one-hour classes on Surrey history at the Old Village School, and you'll be seeing uh, publicity for that later on. 